My name's um, Catherine Barnard, and I've been asked to briefly introduce this magnificent panel. Uh, the previous panel sort of focused on law at home. Uh, this panel is aiming at focusing on law abroad in the broadest possible sense. Now, um, part of my day job is as professor of European Union law. Um, I'm also professor of employment law, so as I say, I do know what redundancy looks like. But um, in between um, all of the um, thought about my own um, precarious future, um, I, Brexit obviously is a very large issue um, on our agenda. But of course, Brexit does not define the law faculty. And indeed, the law faculty has a very long history of being um, open and welcoming to students from right across the globe, but also open and welcoming to academics from across, across the globe. And we have some fantastic um, contacts with other universities. And so the aim of this panel is to look at law through a broader prism and to see what exciting things people can do with legal study. And what I hope this panel will look at is they'll tell you a little bit about the exciting things that they're doing with law and also how they got to that point in time so that we can be inspired. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor over to Nikki Padfield, who's my wonderful colleague, um, who has just stepped down as being Master of Fitzwilliam. Uh, not till Tuesday. Ah. <laughs> She, my wonderful colleague, Nikki Padfield, who's on the point of stepping down <laughs> as Master of Fitzwilliam, um, but also she um, is professor, a professor of criminal law and criminology and a passionate uh, advocate of uh, prisoners' rights and does a lot of work in respect of the European Convention on Human Rights. And she will be uh, chairing the panel, moderating the panel, when she's not acting as child carer, which as you might have seen, she was doing with enthusiasm and she's just become a grandmother again this morning. So she hey. is in. <laughs> so she's on very good form. Let me hand the floor over to Nikki and our wonderful panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Catherine for introducing the introducer in <laughs> one sense. Um, yes, it was great to get a cuddle of somebody else's baby because I haven't cuddled my one yet. Mm -hmm. um, there we are. Thank you very much for bringing your baby. I think it enriches our event enormously that we have a baby here, but maybe um, that says more about me than <laughs> all of you. Um, but it does say something, I think, about multitasking. This panel discussion, Women in the Wider World, is the sort of, I think, the alternative lawyers session. And one of the things which has amused me in the tea break is that it's being brought to my attention that there is no academic lawyer on the panel. So what's happened to academic <laughs> law as um, women in the wider world? I'm delighted to say that Yvonne Cripps talked to me in the gap in the tea break, and Yvonne was the first university lecturer who was a woman in the law faculty, who is a woman in the law <laughs> faculty. And I was astonished to learn from Yvonne that she was appointed as a university lecturer only in 1985. Oh. <coughs> 1985, ladies and gentlemen, was but yesterday. <laughs> So, yes, there's no complacency, I hope, in any of our discussions today. Um, I told my panel that I wasn't nearly as efficient and hardworking as Pippa. I wasn't going to orchestrate the sort of conversation that Pippa so cleverly orchestrated. I wasn't even going to introduce them. They're going to... <laughs> <laughs> They're going to introduce themselves. I've given them five minutes each to say three interesting things. So please spot their three interesting <laughs> things and um, we'll go from there. And as long as I'm a little bit fierce and don't let them go very much over their five minutes, I think we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Pippa again said something about moderators being maybe assertive, maybe bossy, maybe formidable. Moderators also moderate websites, don't they? And they remove obscenities. So maybe I'm going to... 
maybe I'm going to remove your obscenities this afternoon. Um, okay, enough from me, because it's going to be really fun hearing from you. I'm going to start with you. We're going to start with you. Excellent. Who are you? Uh, <laughs> so, hello, everybody. My name's Claire Algar. Um, I'm currently at Amnesty. Uh, and I guess I wanted to start, without looking backwards too much, but just by saying... I really loved that last session, and I just uh, am delighted to be here, but also just want to lift up what uh, Elaine was saying around all of us supporting and committing to do this stuff, because I, I know everybody here will either does at the moment or will do for, for people who are younger, get a constant barrage into inboxes, inviting them to things, and like these are the ones that we all have to continue doing, because they're awesome. That was the first thing. The second thing... Um, which I loved was um, Sarah's point about the, the sort of support piece. And it reflected a party that I was at on Saturday where I was talking to somebody and literally saying, when one's looking for a, a partner, um, usually at that stage in one's life, or, or possibly at any stage in one's life, one's thinking of kind of quick wit and facial symmetry. And... <laughs> <laughs> And what one is not necessarily thinking about is, will this person dry shampoo my hair while I am asleep in 20 years' time? <laughs> and what I say to you is, if anybody is in that space, look at the person you are looking to commit to and ask that question, because if you are going to have the sort of life that uh, hopefully we all will, then you need someone who's going to do that. Um, so I thought what I would do was just sort of talk a little bit about my quite... Uh, probably schizophrenic career um, in the hope that it might at least be a bit inspirational around completely changing what you do from one year to the next. Um, so I started uh, in the best possible way, uh, and it's, I'm not sure, it's probably, well, may not be too late, but anyway, which was with Pippa as my director of studies uh, at, at Keyes. Um, that was fantastic. After that, I spent a year in the Deep South, in Mississippi and Louisiana, um, trying to stop people being executed. So I was working in a, a kind of law center there. Um, I was about 20, um, and it was a genuinely awesome experience because it was completely disruptive. Um, I think very much in this country, when, when you meet somebody, they, they can pretty much reverse engineer uh, where you came from, who you are, which school you went to, whether you went to Cambridge or not. Um, in Louisiana, that didn't happen, right? And so, um, and I was also brought face to face with real obvious injustice um, in a way that my quite sheltered upbringing hadn't brought me face to face with to date. And so I guess one of the things that I'm saying is, is um, try to do something sort of, if, if possible, at, at the beginning of your career, for those, those who are there, uh, try and do something that is sort of out there and will put a pin in what um, really a very steep learning curve looks like. <laughs> um, so that was that. I then returned and I had a training contract um, with a lovely firm, small corporate firm called Collier Bristow. I was there for 10 years. Um, I was an intellectual property litigator. I made partner at 28. Uh, it was a very small firm. Um, and that was awesome. It was a really fun time. Um, but I think maybe the coming up, I don't know, there's something around 10 years maybe, or I don't know, for me, there was anyway. My clients were Calagas, um, EasyJet, and Philip Morris. And it felt to me as though I maybe could be doing more to save the world. Um, <laughs> and also at that point, uh, Guantanamo was kind of a zeitgeisty piece. Um, and I thought, well, I could leave Collie Bristow and try to do something about Guantanamo. Um, and so I joined as executive director a very small then organization called Reprieve um, and I stayed there for eight years and that was a completely terrifying change right because I was partner in a firm I had a great network of lovely people who sent me work and who knew me and my identity was Claire who was this kind of young corporate lawyer person who was doing quite well and going from that to I remember actually when I was offered the job and the point that someone was making here around thinking of calling and turning it down, I was sort of there going, okay, I know nothing about running an NGO. I really don't know very much about human rights law. Uh, I don't know anything about managing a staff of, you know, 15 people. Um, 
and I guess the, uh, the thing that I would say is you would be astonished at how many transferable skills you have. And, and so even if what you do is intellectual property litigation, uh, it is possible to change from that to doing something that feels utterly different. Um, anyway, uh, I did that for eight years. It was great. Uh, we got quite a lot of people out of Guantanamo. We did some very good stuff on the death penalty. Um, probably the best thing was trying to stop drug companies from supplying drugs to death row that they would use in executions. Um, and then from there, I made probably the less dramatic uh, change of moving on to Amnesty International. Um, and I'm there now. Um, I'm the director for research, advocacy, and policy, uh, which is an amazing job. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I would say is working at a tiny startup where you can be agile and do amazing things is one thing, and then working in a much, much bigger organization um, has its own challenges, but also has amazing things, right? So for I spent one day where I went to Denmark, um, and you may be surprised to hear the rape law in Denmark is based on violence rather than consent. Um, because I was at Amnesty and because it was the Danish government, um, I went to Denmark and said, you should change this law. And they said, yes, you are absolutely right. We will do that and we will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the campaigning didn't actually have to be that considerable, but it was based on amazing research that we had done with survivors and lifting up their voices and, and so forth. But, um, you know, and because it's Denmark, they will then put an education piece in around what consent means. And that could actually change the entire culture of a country around um, sexual violence. So. There is amazing stuff you can do in very big organizations. That is one day. The other 364 have been internal management. So just, <laughs> you know, just moderate expectation, I guess, if you're looking at that. So that's all I'm going to say about, about careers. Uh, very I'm starting to cough. Yes, uh, three things really quickly. First one, uh, play to your strengths. And I don't know if this is a gendered thing. I'm not sure it is necessarily. But you have an appraisal and people say, you're amazing at this, you're amazing at this, you're amazing at this, and you need to work on this. And you go away and you think about this. And actually, like, try and do this and delegate this. Because it's much easier doing the stuff that you're great at and that you love. Um, and I'm just going to finish. I'll leave the second one. The other one I want to finish with is around a plea around equality, I guess. Um, which I just feel we should all finish, we, sh we should all sort of do whenever we have any kind of platform. Obviously this one is around, this whole thing is around um, equality and gender equality, and we should all fight for that in any way we can, um, but we should also fight for, we should fight against discrimination around sexuality and identity and race and class and the intersectionality of those pieces and we should all do that as much as we can, and we should all tell everybody else whenever we have a platform to do that as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to that yep. people run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to suspect spontaneity or anything. Um, Sally, the clock is running. Okay, hi, I'm Sally Boyle. Um, the three things that I really want to talk about in telling my story are around confidence, uh, particularly in terms of having a non-linear legal career, which I have definitely had. Uh, the second thing I really want to just remind everybody of is that during the course of your careers, you really need to take risk and look for opportunities too, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then thirdly, and this has been mentioned by the many of the first panelists, is the importance of, in my case, managers, sponsors, and mentors in helping me navigate what has been a very non-linear career. So just to give you my story, um, I came to Cambridge, read law, met my husband, was the first uh, set of women at Queen's College, which was an extraordinary experience in itself. I can talk about that later. Um, and then went to London to be an article clerk. This was in the 80s when they were still called article clerks um, at a London law firm. And I was married very young and wanted to have a young family whilst I was still in my 20s. So fell pregnant and told my boss, who was a woman, an employment lawyer that I wanted to leave and you know sort of be at home with my children and her reaction was you are absolutely crazy Sally you will be bored out of your mind 
And so I said, well, you know, I'd quite like to give it a go, Janet. And she said, no, I'm not going to let you. She said, you are going to do a master's in employment law and industrial relations by distance learning, and you're going to help me write a book on the contract of employment. <laughs> Crikey, I'm seven months pregnant. How on earth am I going to do this? Anyway, sure enough, I had a cesarean section. My husband arrived with flowers and six books that had come from Leicester University, because that day, <laughs> the day of, my, of the birth of my baby, the course started. So the first uh, essay, God alone knows what I talked about because, I mean, I just was in a fog of breastfeeding and everything else. But anyway, got it done. And true to her word, my boss said to me, I, I'll accept the fact you want to take this break, and I'm treating this as a break, but I'm going to keep in touch with you. And so every six months, she came and had a coffee with me or she, you know, kind of invited me to go and have lunch with her in the city or whatever. And so we then moved to Cambridge. My husband's job moved us to Cambridge. Janet still came. And four years in, you know, I'm still not working. Uh, I've completed my master's. And at that point, a number of my friends had made partner in their respective law firms. So I was going down to London to drink champagne. And my friends kept saying to me, you are not ever going to get back into the law. You've been out of it too long. You know, you'll never get back. And I'm like, well... Okay, but, you know, I'm still not quite ready to get back to work. Um, so I just had to sort of maintain my own confidence that I would get back to work. And to be fair, Janet had said to me, I want you to call me, you know, when you are ready to come back. So the summer when my children went to um, primary school here, I remember sitting in the garden in Cambridge with a whole bunch of lovely NCT new mothers and talking about nipple cream and crack nipples and stuff. I thought, I need to get back to work. Um, <laughs> And actually, in fact, we'd also been to a dinner party that weekend where somebody had introduced me to a guest as, they didn't even use my name, they didn't say it's Sally, they just said, this is Kareen's wife and Adam and Ollie's mummy. And I thought, oh my goodness, mm. I've lost my identity. I really need to get back to work. So sure enough, I called Janet and she said, absolutely. And I said, but I need to come back part-time, Janet, because I can't do this full-time commute to London. My husband's a junior barrister treading, you know, all over the country to um, defend and prosecute criminals. So she said, fine, that's fine. I know you. I think it'll be okay. We're not going to tell anybody in the firm that you're part-time. We're not going to tell clients that you're part-time. You need a full-time nanny, and we'll have to be flexible. I'm like, okay, I'm, that's all fine. So I went back to work part-time, and interestingly, it was actually the most difficult part in my career because working part-time, balancing work with play, no technology, this is still in the early 90s, although a computer had landed on my desk when I arrived back at the office, which I didn't know what to do with. Um, but in any event, it was, it was quite tough, but you know, I managed to juggle it until um, you know, my, Janet said to me, you know, look, you're going to have to go full-time in order to be a partner in the firm. Um, and actually, her observation of me was that I had really lost my confidence. When I ca first came back to the office, I remember saying to her, don't give me any clients. I don't want the phone to ring. I don't know anything. She said, Sally, you know, what's happened to you? And I said, no, 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 Janet, I really don't know anything. Um, anyway, after six months, I still got back into it. But as, I, as she asked me to go full time, I said, I'm just not ready to do that. So I turned to Cambridge and thought actually it would be easier if I could work in Cambridge. So I was offered a job at Milton Reeve, a local law firm here. Uh, which was a great opportunity to do very different work, work with Cambridge University and a lot of NHS trusts um, uh, instruct Mills and Reeves. So great, you know, very different practice. And it was fantastic for me because I could take my children to school every morning. I could go to, you know, meet, him, meet them after work, after school and, you know, be home from work. Mills and Reeves actually had an hour and a half for lunch, so I could do my Sainsbury's shop during lunchtime. It was great. Um, but I eventually realized that actually, from a career perspective, I would like to get back to the city. And this is when, you know, I took some risks, but also my network of friends who I had maintained in the city was really important because I called a bunch of people and said I'd really like to come back to the city. And so they put my name forward for various jobs, one of which was to be the first sort of employment law in-house lawyer um, at Goldman Sachs. I didn't know what an in-house employment lawyer would do. Um, I had no idea when I went for the first interview. But actually, as I had more and more interviews with Goldman Sachs, 32 in total, um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely extraordinary, um, across in London and in New York, I realized that actually this was going to be a very interesting job. They'd never had an employment lawyer in Europe before. Basically, Americans had set up the offices in every country you can imagine, American style with, you know, an offer letter that had one paragraph and, you know, no reference whatsoever to any employment laws in any country in which we were operating. 
So um, I joined and was, you know, it was a fantastic opportunity. We'd had a race discrimination claim in the mid 90s, which had gone down very poorly. And it was obvious that they needed quite a lot of help in getting themselves in shape. So I very quickly uh, built a team around me and made managing director. And in fact, it was very interesting when I made managing director because my um, boss was a woman there as well. And she had said to me right from the start, I don't care where you work, Sally. You live in Cambridge, you've got two small boys, you just do the work on the train, you know, whatever, I don't, don't mind if you leave early, it's fine. When I made MD, one of my male colleagues came into the office and said to me, Sally, you know, we're really surprised, we are really surprised that you've made MD. I said, oh, thanks very much, Robert. <laughs> and um, he, said, uh, he said, well, you don't work as hard as we do. And I said, how do you know that, Robert? And he said, well, you, you, don't, the, you leave the office at quarter past six every night. And I said, yes, I do. And I get on the train at quarter to seven. And I work for an hour till quarter to eight. I have supper with my family. And then my husband and I sit and work until you know, we're ready to go to bed because he's always preparing a case for the next day, et cetera. And then I work for the hour on the train coming back in the morning. So you don't see me working, but I am working. And it was, it was such an interesting observation of sort of face time and you know, the way in which you know, my male colleagues work versus you know, the empowerment that actually my boss had given me to do the work wherever. So, um, yes, okay, my final, the, the, my final um, transition, which really was from law now to, to HR, was um, sort of 10 years into my job at Goldman Sachs, I was asked to become the HR director in Europe. And this was the day actually Lehman Brothers went down. I thought I was actually going to be asked to make everybody redundant because I was the employment lawyer. And in fact, I was asked to be the head of HR. My reaction was, I don't know anything about HR. And the two CEOs said, you know, you will be fine. You can learn the job, but you've got really good skills that we need. You communicate well. Lawyers are great influencers. You know, you're analytical and critical thinkers. That's what we need uh, in, in our HR uh, director. So, you know, I, you don't feel you have any choice when you're offered that sort of job. So I took it, was quite reluctant to leave the law, particularly as my father had always wanted me to be a lawyer. So I didn't tell, pull the plug on you. tell him for three, 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 three months that I'd, I'd uh, taken this mm -hmm. job. But it has been an extraordinary opportunity um, to do something very different, use my legal skills, be a director of the bank, um, promote you know, diversity, inclusion, mental health, all sorts of topics which we've talked about today. So a great opportunity, a bit of a risk, but a great opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Lucy, what clock is running? Uh, I'll be very brief. Good at being brief. So the first question uh, that Catherine asked was, how did we get here? And I got here because of Nikki, because I applied to Cambridge and they were very clever because they rejected me uh, and put me in the pool. And Nikki took me out of the pool and interviewed me and uh, gave me a place, and then was my uh, supervisor for three years, um, or some of that three years. So thank you, Nikki, because this was the beginning of my journey. Um, I, like uh, Claire, also, when I left Cambridge, wanted to save the world. Uh, and I spent, a, a, in my gap year after university, I went to work for the UN and went to work for the European Commission. And I thought, the, as, in, as an intern, thinking, you know, these were the organizations that made significant change and I was going to make significant change in them. And I realized when you're 21, you actually can't do anything at all. <laughs> so I went to become a barrister. My grandmother had been a barrister and she was a great inspiration to me. So I was a barrister for 17 years and then but I never really lost that desire to make a change in society. I had two kids and I looked at them and I thought, you know, it's really important that I bring them up um, and ensure that they are good people and amazing children. But I want to do more than this. And so I thought of lots of different things. I thought maybe I applied actually to be a commissioner on the Social Mobility Commission, and foolishly they interviewed me, but I had absolutely no skills for this job at all or any experience, and so quite rightly I didn't get the job. Um, and actually I thought the only way that I can make a difference, and the best way that I can make a difference, is to become an MP. So I uh, very thankfully got selected to an amazing seat just around the corner in South East Cambridgeshire, and I think being an MP is one of the uh, best ways, the most worthwhile ways to make a difference in society. It's fantastic being a, uh, a backbench MP. 
I feel that uh, through most of the work that my staff have done, we've changed people's lives on an individual basis. But as I've been a minister for two years, I was, uh, uh, you know, they keep giving me justice jobs because they think I've got some expertise in that area. So I was a justice minister, junior justice minister, responsible for courts and court reform and legal aid. It's then very honored to be this, appointed as the Solicitor General. But politics moves very quickly. So after two months, I was promoted to be a Minister of State, again in the Ministry of Justice. And I'm now responsible for prisons and probation. So my three takeaways are firstly, support. Um, support is really important. It's really important to support others. And it's really important to take support whenever you can take it. Just tell you a very quick story. I mentioned my grandmother. My grandmother was a barrister until she was 80. And she had two uh, young children that came to do her gardening. They were Indian children. She lived in a very Indian populated area in Leicester. And they didn't speak very much English. And she taught them English when, after the gardening. And when she died, one of the um, boys wrote to my father. Um, and he said, I am now a banker in Hong Kong. And I would never have done this without the support of your mother, my grandmother. So those two boys, they took support. They took support from a very, very unusual su source. Now, I'm sure many of your mentors or, or, me or have been mentees. I think we need to take support wherever we can do it. It's a lesson I learned as an MP very early on uh, when we were first elected. Some cabinet ministers and ex-cabinet ministers said to us all, uh, you will go up and you will come down. And you have to be nice on the way up and you need to be nice on the way down because you will see the same people on the way up and on the way down. And you can see that now. You can see cabinet ministers who've become cabinet ministers and then backbench MPs and then cabinet ministers again. And uh, we need to be nice to everyone and support them and look out for them and reach out to them in our journey, which will go up and down. Uh, one of my uh, pupil masters, David Anderson, uh, I was obviously his pupil, um, and then I, the next time I saw him, I was on the uh, investigatory, investigatory powers bill committee, and at the time, uh, he was the um, security advisor to the terrorism advisor to the government, so I was cross-examining him as a member of the bill committee. So you see people in your life in different ways, and I think it's just really important to continue those relationships, which will serve you well throughout your careers. My second takeaway is do it. Uh, you know, when you apply to become, uh, uh, to become an MP, you have to first get on your party's list. And I'm told by uh, the woman, amazing woman, who used to be the chair of uh, the, the candidates list, that when you apply to Conservative Central Office for the form to fill in, to go on the list, which is the first step of becoming an MP, when they send that list to a man, he, it's returned within 48 hours. And when they, when they send that application form to a woman, it's returned 14 months later. And I was mentioning this to uh, actually a group of women recently in a, in a panel event. And one of the women said to me, that's because women are... F it, it, some people think it's uh, for the reason that uh, someone said earlier that we don't necessarily think we're good enough and we're thinking I can't do all those, those criteria uh, on the application form. But I think it's something else as well. We as women are thinking, can I juggle my career? Do I want this job? Am I going to do all the other things that I want to do, bringing up a child, um, at the same time as doing this very um, busy job that's going to take up um, my time? So my answer to that is if you want to do it, just do it and tell you a story about that. I, uh, when I became a candidate, I went round the constituency. Don't worry, Nikki, I've only got one more point left. Uh, I became uh, a candidate in South East Cambridgeshire. I spent 18 months. I stopped taking cases as a barrister, and I spent 18 months um, going, going to the constituency, spending all my time there and speaking uh, to potential constituents. And I was at a WI event, and I was probably about a year in, to this and I had two children um, they're now th 14 and 11 so they were probably eight and s sort of five at the time um, and one of the women I was telling what I did and one of the women said to me what do your children think about you doing this 
And I thought, do you know what? I don't really know what they think about me doing this. this I decided this is what I wanted to do. I, I worked very hard as a barrister, but I was a good mum. I was there for most of my, well, probably all of the children's events. But I'd never really thought about what they thought about me being an MP. So I went home and I said to Jacob, who was my oldest child at the time, Jacob, you know, what do you actually think about me being an MP? And he said, I'm really proud of you, mummy. He's not always proud now. <laughs> but I think sometimes we hold ourselves back and those people who love us do want us to do what we want to do. Uh, and my third point is, and this is a very brief point, uh, but it's two points, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still very, very brief. So my third point is, enjoy it and ask yourself, will it matter in 10 years' time? And I'm going to explain that a bit further. So enjoy it. Uh, and tell you a little story about that. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm very, very quick. So, I first met Boris Johnson uh, when I was first elected in 2015, and I was on a table, and it was a spon it was a it was a fundraising event, and Boris Johnson uh, came up to our table, and the people who were I was the uh, the, uh, the recently elected MP for South East Cambridgeshire, and uh, everyone else on the table was from BT, and they worked for BT, so. Uh, Boris came up to the table and he was like introduced to everyone and he came up to me and he said, uh, he shook my hand and he said, uh, so what do you do in BT? <laughs> and the, the host of the table said, Boris, this is Lucy Fraser and she's just been elected as the MP for South East Cambridgeshire. And his face just absolutely fell and he didn't know what to put it. Oh, right, okay. And every time he saw me after that, he went, South East Cambridgeshire, Lucy Fraser. Um, so... Uh, when you make mistakes, I think we always have to, I always say to myself, not very good at always putting into practice, but will it really matter in 10 years' time? Sometimes we eat ourselves up with things that we should have done, we should have said, things we should have gone for, we didn't do that quite right. And I think for minor things, it doesn't really matter. It won't matter in 10 years' time. So move on, get on with it, move on to the next thing. But whilst you're on this journey, enjoy it. Because sometimes... We're always looking at that goal, reaching out for that goal. And that goal is fulfilling, but only for a short period of time. So we have to enjoy the journey as well. Thank you very much. Welcome, Katerina. Hello. Um, I'm Katerina Gould, and I'm uh, an executive coach now with my own practice, Thinking Potential. And in terms of talking about my career and, and how law has featured in it, I, I'm sort of slightly embarrassed to say it hasn't really featured apart from my three years at Cambridge. Um, because I read law really as a sort of route into the business world in general. I didn't have a particular direction I wanted to go in, but law seemed to be a, a, a good starting point. Um, and following my law degree, I worked in the city, I worked in healthcare, I worked in media, I did an MBA at Harvard and came to the point where I had two young children and a sick elderly mother and I couldn't continue. So I actually stopped working for eight years and then in going back to work, I retrained as an executive coach through doing a psychotherapy um, in introduction. And I've been working as an executive coach, working with um, people in professional services, financial services, um, retail and FMCG, people aspiring to be leaders, people who are new into leadership role, people who want to become leaders and people who are leaders and finding it quite lonely and challenging. And one of the sort of subsets of, of people that I was interested in was my, my peer group of professionally qualified women who were at the point of wanting to return to careers if they'd taken a break and just finding it almost impossible, even if they had the confidence, even if they had the contacts, the routes into organizations were just not there. So together with a similarly minded uh, colleague, we co-founded and we were directors of Women Returners, which does what it says on the tin. It works with organizations that want to provide routes back into the workplace for professionally qualified women, and the women who, who are looking to um, return. We started in 2012 with just becoming a um, resource for, for, for women, um, gathering all the kinds of information that just wasn't available before then in one single place. And 2014, we started our first program, which was actually 
taking the model that was invented by Goldman Sachs of a returnship, which is like an adult internship. And we introduced it into the UK. We had three programs in 2014. Um, and by last year, 2018, there were 68 programs. So this idea of women being not on the scrap heap if they've left their careers is, is fading um, for the women as well as the organizations that want to employ them. And it's gaining traction um, across multiple sectors. And it's doing something for equality um, in a small way and gender pay gap and, and all those other things that we are all so concerned about. Um, I've actually stepped away from being director of that business because I had another interest that I wanted to pursue, which is I'm, as well as doing my coaching and I've got a couple of board roles, I'm training as a psychotherapist. And um, I'm in sort of that next stage of my career, which leads me to my first takeaway, which is to build on something Priya said earlier about careers being a jungle gym rather than a ladder. It's a phrase that was used by Sheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In. Um, which I think a number of us have referred to, even if not directly, in, in what we've been saying. Um, ladders are limiting. I mean, I know we heard a panel of women before us, many of whom have succeeded in climbing the ladder, but pretty much you can only go up, down, or sideways, and there's only one route, pretty much. Whereas in a jungle gym, you've got a much more, if you think about that analogy, it's a much more creative way of thinking about building your career. You can go up, you can go sideways, you can go down, you can pause for a bit. Um, and in all the things that you're doing, you're creating, you're taking building blocks that you will ultimately use in whatever it is you, you then end up doing. And there are many routes to get to where you want to get to. Um, the second point, I also want to pick up on something that was meant in the, mentioned in the first panel, which is, we have to make this not a women's issue. We have to engage the other half of the population. Um, and it's in action and not just in talking. Um, there was a research carried out by women returners together with PwC in 2016, which discovered that if the career break penalty was addressed, i.e. women can come back into the workplace and come back at a level that they would have been if they hadn't stepped out. Um, it could have an overall economic impact of 1.7 billion on the economy. Um, and there's also a social point to this in terms of the society we want our children to grow up in and the equality that we want them to be able to take part in. So I've got two practical examples of, of how to engage men if you're, if you're thinking of how to possibly do this. Um, my alma mater and, and uh, Amanda's as well, St Paul's Girls School, created an initiative called Dads for Daughters. Um, it's based on the he for she model where the fathers were invited to the school and were talked to about these issues and were invited to pledge to achieve greater gender equality, and that's now spread to many other schools, and even some businesses have now adopted it. Um, there's also a very recent example of something called the 50-50 Project at the BBC, um, which was led by Ros Atkins of Outside Source, who's a fantastic journalist. And that was very simply to achieve a balanced gender representation in front of the camera. Um, and they reached 50% balance men and women in only four months, simply by actually just counting and monitoring the balance and in um, putting attention onto it and being a bit more creative and, and thoughtful about who they're inviting onto the panels. This project has now been adopted by 500 um, different departments and teams across the BBC. The final thing I want to say from my career and from the work that I've done is that if you are pausing your career, or thinking about it, or I see there's some younger people in the room, if they're thinking, I'm just starting out my career, but I don't know how it's going to take me, um, don't assume anymore that if you pause your career, that that's the end of it. Um, thanks to Women Returners and others, Donna's original business, Obelisk Law, also um, promotes opportunities for, for women or people who want to flexibly to, to be in the law. 
Um, there's lots of organizations which are now actively supporting returning to, to the workplace. And employers are much more open to considering returners than they were in 2012 when we started. Thank you very much indeed, Priscilla. So um, we didn't know if we were alone. So when I was on the train coming, thinking myself about it. I decided that I wouldn't because if I told them when I got in, I would always think it was because they felt sorry for me. So I came to the interview, I did my best, I thought I was dreadful, and I was astonished to be accepted. And I recall that when I started at Cambridge, I still didn't know if my father was alive or dead, and that was, I don't know, nine months later, something like that. And eventually, my mother rang again from Nigeria to say that one of my father's school friends had rung her. He was a military doctor, and he had been sent to treat a patient who was dying in a military hospital, because the government were afraid that they had, were about to kill, they, they, they treated him in a way which was about to kill him, basically. So he was astonished when he turned up at this military hospital to find his old school friend, who was my father. My father was about six foot five, and by the time this military doctor saw him, he weighed about eight stone, and he had been tortured, and uh, you know, all his hair had gone gray, because of fear, presumably. And I remember the first time I saw him after his release, when I hugged him, I could feel every vertebrae down his back because he was so thin. And that is why when on Tuesday morning, I was in the CPS office with my colleagues watching the BBC with that slightly out of sync coverage with Baroness Hale reading out the judgment. My heart was bursting with pride that I have become a lawyer in a country where there is the rule of law. Because what happened to my father is what happens when the rule of law disappears. <laughs> so um, I don't want to offend Lucy, because you're a really nice lady, but it makes, me, it makes my blood boil when I hear people say that they are having fun with what's going on in Parliament at the moment. Um, I'll try not to make it too political. All right. So, uh, <laughs> but I mean, You've I think that's not, that's not about politics, about decency and integrity and treating people well. So, back to Lucy Cav. I had the great <laughs> honour to be taught by Nikki Padfield. And when I saw Nikki's name pop up on my email the other week, I was just thrilled because she was one of the few people who really talked me, rather than talked at me for an hour, telling me how clever they were and funny stories about their cases. She really helped me understand constitutional law. Uh, and as I was hearing the judgment, listening to it at work, I thought, she is the reason I understand all this. And, and, I'm, so, and I'm so pleased I'm going to see her at the end of the week. So anyway, so I, I, went to, I, I, I had a really fantastic time at Lucy Cavendish. And then I went to the bar and was in chambers for eight years. And actually, I can take this off now, can't I? It doesn't work. <laughs> Um, and then I, I sort of, can you tell me when I've got two minutes left, please? I will. Thank you. Um, and I'll then be I, telling you quite quickly. <laughs> all right. Okay. So really, really quickly, um, I, I went to Chambers, 
I didn't get on with the clerks. I didn't get them, they didn't get me. I decided to work with the CPS. So I joined the CPS in 2006. I worked there for a few months and then I was made the head of the unit I was working in, which was very nice. And then from there, this is a truncated history, and then from there I went to the Home Office and worked in the UK Central Authority, where my love of all things international law bega be began. From there I worked in, as a seconded national expert in the European Commission. And I had a very happy time there until the 16th of June when the referendum result uh, happened and uh, my husband and I had to move back to London because uh, you know, I was no longer required. So after working in Brussels, I came back to London, worked for a year in the Home Office Legal Strategy Unit of the International uh, Directorate. And uh, after that, then I got my current job, which is as a specialist prosecutor in the Special Crime and Counterterrorism Division of the Crown Prosecution Service. And I really, really love my job. And part of the reason I love it, because I work with fantastic people who are really supportive and who are kind and they're funny and they bring cakes and all of that. <laughs> uh, 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 but, but also because I feel that I'm empowered to do the right thing. I don't have any pressure on me to charge as many people as possible. I just have the pressure to do the right thing, make the right legal judgment. Don't charge people against whom there's not enough evidence. Charge only those for whom there's enough evidence and where there's a public interest in prosecuting them. Now, really quickly, my three takeaways are find a workplace in which you can be who you really are. And I think the sort of management jargon is that be authentic. Bring the whole of you to work. Because I'm at work for quite a long time every day, and I think it would be terribly difficult to be somebody else. <laughs> um, the second thing is be brave. And I find it quite hard to be brave, but I think I remember Hillary Clinton saying, dare to compete, dare to apply for that job, even if you reject it. Only yesterday I got a rejection from the Judicial, App <laughs> Judicial Appointments Council, and I wanted to speak to you about that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> That's networking. <laughs> <laughs> um, be honest. Be honest to yourself about yourself and be honest to other people about who they are. Stand up for yourself. And I think that can take a lot of courage, but do it. And nothing bad happens when you tell people no, or you can't speak to me like that. Nothing bad happens. You know, do it in a polite and assertive way. And I just say, be brave. Right, the third thing is embrace your vulnerability. I suffer quite badly from depression. And it's, it's, I feel a bit ashamed to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it anyway, because it makes me feel that I'm incompetent and that I'm not able to manage my life properly because I have these periods where I, I just feel, you know, death would be better than how I'm feeling. Um, and that means that I can't really function terribly well when I'm in that place. So I have to be clear with myself that I can't play rough. You know, when I can feel it coming on, what I need to do is to rest. So I need to tell people... I need to take a bit of time off. I don't care what the case is, because actually the alternative for me is worse than losing the case. Um, and so I, I have learned to embrace that vulnerability and I think it helps me to feel compassion about other people who are having a tricky time, particularly at work. I'm very lucky I have a really happy uh, relationship with my husband, who, funnily enough, is Danish. And my experience is that it's not always so easy to persuade the Danes. <laughs> 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 right. Um, that's it. Thank you. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to clap. Um, Jill, stop them clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Start talking now. Okay, I don't really... I, coming at the end, or almost the end, Bella has the, is going to have the... Uh, the, the the bookend job. Um, it's quite hard on one level because people have said a lot of things that you would want to say. So look, I thought I'd start with saying, okay, I'm a woman, I'm a lesbian, I'm a mother, I've got an ex-husband, uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, I'm a Charlton Athletic fan, whatever. <laughs> and over the years, all those things have been more or less important and I've balanced some of them much more than others. I undoubtedly have allowed myself to be defined by my work. Keelan will know that. We've done a lot together over the years. Um, and sometimes uh, I have also had mental health issues where I have let my personal life or decisions become too much and I've had to take time away. And when you've had that experience once, I think you learn, you, you can learn from it. Um, and it makes you actually a slightly more kinder person on yourself. 
which is something to just, just to remember in all of this. Anyway, I'm going to try and feed my points into my, a little bit of career thing. So I, I read history at Selwyn uh, for, for two years. I did my part ones in history. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, you know, that getting, getting to Cambridge and reading history was enough for me for quite a long time. And then suddenly I thought, God, what am I going to do? Uh, so I switched to law in the days when it was quite easy to do so. I did two years here, uh, uh, did my part two law, went off, followed, followed the pack uh, down to Guildford and then ended up in the city in a law firm going, my God, what am I doing here? I don't fit in at all. Uh, I have no idea what all this law is, or most of it, you know, corporate, commercial. Ugh. I thought for some reason the first seat they put me in was a probate and trust seat for rich people. Um, and I, you know, I sort of very quickly started learning actually about myself. And my first sort of takeaway point really was about, which has come out from people, personal authenticity. You have to work out who you are and what you want and what you don't mind fighting for and what you don't give a fuck about, actually. Um, and I sort of realized I really didn't give a fuck about money and banking and all that stuff. I just didn't. Uh, and I used to, even in those days, I used to be a Guardian reader, which for those of you who've read the Biob will know that's where I am now as a lawyer. Um, but I used to put the Guardian, I used to read the Guardian, and, but going into the, uh, off the, the office up the lifts um, in Aldermanbury Square, I used to put the Guardian inside my jacket because everybody else was reading other newspapers that were obviously far better than the one I was reading. And I started realizing I was different. And you know, that was part of the process for me coming out as well. I got married, I had kids. But you know, over the years, I sort of realized that actually I was gay and I just needed to get on with it. And it wasn't so bad. Telling my parents was not the enormous, awful thing I thought it was going to be, even though I was sort of 33. So you know, I'm a late, a late comer to things. Um, but you know, yeah, knowing yourself, sorting out yourself, you know, there are different jobs everywhere for all of us. And uh, if you're lucky, you find the right one for you. Um, so having gone into the city and going, oh, God, I don't like this. You know, and what I would also say is there's a lot of blind alleys you go down, but no blind alley is a wasted alley. Mm. You, you learn things. You learn what you don't like. And sometimes that's as important mm as knowing what you do like. And there are some people who are fantastic and know from a very early age what they do like. I didn't really know that until I went there. Then <laughs> I started learning what I didn't like. I, I applied for various jobs, nothing really tempted me. And then I saw an advert one day for the BBC as a litigation lawyer, which is what I'd qualified as, a civil litigation lawyer. And I thought, the BBC, that sounds fantastic. So I, I went off there. The chap who was running it at the time was an ex-Cambridge law graduate who liked a bit of drink at lunchtime. And it was all quite quiet. There was no such thing as media law. It just wasn't there in those days. Um, and so I, I went there as a litigator. They just fought and lost uh, Panorama's Maggie's, Maggie's militant tendency, for those of you who remember it, Neil Hamilton and a lot of sort of Nazi salutes. And uh, they were just trying to get their house in order in something that was a developing area. So I was very lucky because I sort of picked it up as it happened. Um, and I've stayed, that's where I've stayed. I've stayed as an in-house media lawyer. I popped out for a couple of years, taught at the College of Law um, on the solicitor's course and did, did a year of teaching crime. Only thank, thanks John Spencer for everything I knew about, about <laughs> crime. So you can imagine where my bench was on that side. Um, but there, I you know, came back, went to the Times. Uh, I've, I've worked at the BBC, I've worked for the Times, I've worked for the Sun and the News of the World and at the Guardian. And that sort of takes us to my second point, which is that uh, getting to The Guardian, I actually was, was always a sort of dream, but I thought I'd never get there because by that, by, I was in my mid-50s at, uh, no, late, early 50s at the Times. My boss was only a couple of years older than me. I couldn't really see any progression there. And the main lawyer at The Guardian was younger than me. Um, so you sort of go, okay, just stay where you are. You're quite happy, okay, <coughs> working for Murdoch, they'll park that. Um, I'm still doing media, free speech, open justice stuff, which I have come to value. Um, and then the person at The Guardian decided that they were going off to Ofcom and having a different career route. And suddenly this door opened that I thought was shut. Um, and so I went there, got interviewed, got the job, um, and I'm still there, but <laughs> for good or bad. And you know, I've had a fantastic time. I think one of the themes is we all love our jobs, from, mm. the, from what I gather. So, you know, I, I've had super injunctions, I've had WikiLeaks, Snowden, Panorama Papers, all, all sorts of things, and they just come at you. Um, 
And how much law I do, as opposed to strategy with a little bit of law lurking in the background, I don't know. But, you know, the, the, the great thing about the law is there are lots and lots of nooks and cranny, crannies for, for all sorts of people who are not quite, you know, the straight line lawyers that solicitors and barristers' practices allow you to be. Uh, and, and so I, I just say, you know, just don't think about it in narrow terms. There's masses of opportunity there. Um, and so don't be afraid to go off piste is my second message if you hadn't picked that up. Um, and the third thing, and the only other thing I was going to say, which is picking up on something that's already been said, I also sit as a part-time employment tribunal judge. I've done it for 20 years. I don't practice in employment law. It doesn't matter. And there is an enormous amount of opportunity for people, particularly women, particularly solicitors, in the tribunal system. And it's a way up as well. Um, and so I really would encourage people to think about that uh, as a possible thing. You can do it in parallel as part-timers. So that's... Thank you very much, Bella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it's a warm audience. Fantastic. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Bella Sankey and I am, um, like everybody on these fantastic panels today, a, a privileged um, graduate, law graduate from Cambridge University. I'm here because of um, Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Eilish Ferrin and uh, Professor Mark Elliott who's lurking on the back seat, on the back row over there. You may have heard him on the Today programme this morning. Um, uh, and I'm really honoured to be here, and I'm really um, pleased and really delighted that alongside a panel of um, brilliant practitioners, um, there was a decision to put on a panel like this today. Um, we talked a bit about imposter syndrome in the last panel, and as somebody who studied law but has made my career um, at the kind of intersection of law and politics and, and doing civil society work, I often feel a bit like a fraud and not like a real lawyer. Um, and so, yeah, it was really good, I think, to open up that discussion and also to have uh, a panel that recognises the achievements of people with legal qualifications and legal training that decide to make their uh, work kind of elsewhere uh, other than the courtroom. Uh, my first message, I think, my first kind of takeaway point is that when you have a legal education and legal training, particularly an institution like this, you can be an Im incredibly important, I think, um, uh, and, and a powerful tool for good, pursuing public interest causes and working uh, in civil society. Uh, we have in this country a very lively, very robust uh, and brilliant civil society. Uh, I think that's really grown up over many decades, um, probably not least since the 1919 uh, Act, which allowed women to operate with a legal education in all parts of civil life. Um, and we have, uh, I think, a, 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 a very flexible constitution, but a constitution that is made more robust and, and even stronger by having an active um, civil society that will take test case litigation uh, and that will challenge government and hold government to account, protecting the rights of minorities and, and protecting our democracy in, in so doing. Uh, so that's where I've made my career. I spent a long time working at Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties. I worked at Reprieve, um, uh, and I'm currently the director of, an, of a national charity called Detention Action that supports people being held in immigration detention centres in the UK and campaigns for fundamental reform. And throughout my career, I have worked on a lot of exciting, but also I think very important uh, causes and campaigns to further human rights protection in the UK, whether it's resisting the Blair government's um, infringements of civil liberties and attempts to extend uh, pre-charge detention to 90 days, then 42 days, pre-charge detention bingo at one point, it was guess your limit. Um, or whether it was working to um, ensure that identity cards that were also being brought in by a kind of authoritarian push uh, back in the, the early 2000s were ultimately scrapped. I worked um, to ensure that modern day slavery was criminalized not as long ago as it should have been, um, and to ultimately save the Human Rights Act from repeal uh, from a coalition and then a conservative government that was hell bent uh, until pretty recently on scrapping the act and pulling us out of the European uh, Convention. 
so there is exciting and, as I say, important work uh, to be done, and that work is done uh, most often in the Parliament chamber when you work in civil society. There are, uh, as I say, test case um, uh, cases that you can work on and that you can initiate, which are incredibly important. But I've actually seen firsthand how important it can be to win battles in the parliamentary chamber. Um, and when you do so, although you have to be patient and you have to be prepared to be in for the long haul, uh, the win and the gain is incredible because you have, at a stroke, managed to change the lives potentially of hundreds, if not thousands, of people or ensure that, um, uh, that hard edge protections have been written into the law uh, that will hold government to account and will ensure that people's rights are respected. Um, my second point today, I think, is that while we are here celebrating uh, an extraordinary and, uh, and a brilliant anniversary, I think it's really important as women and as human beings to remember that while huge gains and strides have been made in the last hundred years, we have so much further to go and there are still glaring injustices uh, in the UK today. Uh, and as we sit here this afternoon, um, I don't want to bring the mood uh, right down, but I do want to remind people that currently there are thousands of people sat in immigration detention centres, uh, sat there indefinitely with absolutely no time limit, many of them survivors of torture, survivors of human trafficking, not knowing when they're going to be released and being re-traumatised re and oppressed um, in a country that prides itself um, it, on, it, you know, with pri prides itself um, <coughs> and having a tradition of freedom, a tradition of tolerance, uh, a tradition of uh, welcoming people that are fleeing persecution. And yet, and yet, in 2019, we still lock people up indefinitely. Another issue that I wanted to mention, because it, because it is a day um, to celebrate women and women's rights, is that right now in the UK, if you want to go to your GP or you want to go to a midwife appointment, as I did not so very long ago, you will be asked at your first appointment with a midwife to hand over your immigration status and to declare your passport number. And it is because of that hostile environment and that uh, 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 policy that there are pregnant women right now in the UK not seeking medical advice and not getting antenatal appointments. And I know that I owe my own life and my daughter's life to the NHS. And had I not sought an appointment, uh, an appointment like that, we might not be here today. So I say that just to remind people that there are so many fights, particularly fights for women, but fights for all of us that need to still be, um, still be taken and still be won. Um, my final message, I think, is one of hope, <laughs> uh, and I want to uh, uh, focus on the positive as I, as I finish up. Um, and I think that it will take female practitioners, female women working in the wider world, and some men as well, um, to carry on taking those fights and winning those fights, um, and that we need to be bold and we need to work together, hand in glove, in order to ensure that the gains of the last hundred years are um, built upon and that we don't go backwards, as is so easy to do um, in a parliamentary democracy, albeit one very much under the rule of law, um, but that those battles need to be fought and taken and that we need to work collaboratively as women and as people um, to make those gains. To give you one example of some work that's currently ongoing that I think really demonstrates how women and I men... <laughs> uh, working, con working together can achieve that sort of change uh, is uh, work that's going on right now around the immigration bill which as a, a result of Tuesday's Supreme Court judgment is still live in Parliament and that's work that I've been um, doing with a number of immigration law practitioners, senior women in their profession, women like Stephanie Harrison and Laura Dubinsky uh, and solicitors like Janet Farrell at Bat Murphy to try and put a time limit in place on immigration detention. We drafted a beautifully crafted, uh, robust amendment which we're hoping to attach to the immigration bill and then I've been working with senior women across the political parties in Parliament. So some of Lucy's colleagues in the Conservative Party, people like Caroline Spellman uh, and other good Conservatives, uh, SNP members uh, like, uh, like, like
like like uh, Joanna Cherry, uh, who is now I think a household name. Uh, sorry, I'll I'll I'll, I'll finish up. Um, Harriet Harman, Diane Abbott, uh, and that amendment has been tabled to the bill. Um, it at the moment stands to win if the report if the bill ever gets to report stage in the House of Commons. Um, and it's by cross party endeavour. It's by using legal skills. Uh, but also using negotiating and diplomatic skills to achieve positive change that we have come to this point. We're really close, but we're still also really far. Um, but I want to leave you with that message of what can be done uh, and hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I make absolutely no apology for having taken 10 minutes of your tea break <laughs> to have allowed you absolutely no time for questions <laughs> because I felt all those wonderful women actually deserved to speak to you. <laughs> really inspiring presentations. Thank you very, very much indeed. Please come and ask your questions at the tea break. It's really important that the conversations keep going. You can't borrow the baby, though. <laughs>